Uh, first, I, I, I wish to read some formal notices. Um, I wish to remind members, staff, witnesses and those in the public gallery to turn off their mobile phones um, because they interfere with the sound system. So I just ask people here to check that their phones are turned off. Um, and just to make sure that there's nothing interfering with the microphones in, in front of you there. Um, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, uh, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence uh, to this committee. However, if you were directed by the Chairman to seize given evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue, continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside of the houses or any official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. It's proposed that um, any submissions or opening statements or other documents supplied by the witnesses to the committee for this meeting be published um, on the committee website. Is, is that agreed? Agreed. Um, on behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome the following witnesses to the meeting today to consider the Smart uh, Community Initiative and Grow Remote. Uh, Deputy Sean Kenny, Minister of State at the Department of Rural and Community Development and at the Department of Communications, Climate Action and the Environment, with special responsibility for natural resources, community affairs and digital uh, development. Uh, the Minister is accompanied uh, today by uh, Caroline Henry. Assistant Principal, National Digital Strategy Unit at the Department of Communications, Climate Action and the Environment. Uh, Mr. Jake Ryan, Assistant Principal, uh, um, Department of Rural and Community Development. And Mr. Johnny uh, Gorman, Higher Education Officer, Regional uh, Telecommunications Development Unit. Department of Rural and Community Development. Uh, representatives from Grow Remote, uh, uh, Ms. Tracy Kyo, his co-founder, and Mr. Paul Elenstag, uh, he's a chapter leader. So you're all very welcome. Um, I'd now like to ask um, Minister of State Canning to, for his opening statement. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and I'm delighted to be back here. Um, um, been a former member of the committee before I took up this role and to say I want to thank the members for their invitation to discuss the, the Smart Community Initiative. Um, just a, in a bit of background, first of all, the internet and digital technologies are transforming the way people live and work today, yet figures from the CSO show that one in seven people living in Ireland have never used the internet. They cite the lack of skills and the belief that they don't need it as a key barrier to using it. At a foundation level, minimising the digital divide is firstly about broadband connectivity for the population. And as 5G technology advances to provide wider geographic coverage of, pla of places, next comes basic foundation skills and literacy to enable people to discover the constructive applications of digital technology and content. Addressing the foundations of the digital divide means, in the main, reaching out to the most marginalised in society and helping them, them to participate in the digital society. The Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment's Digital Skills for Citizens scheme is providing basic digital skills for uh, classes for people to help them in their first steps online. However, classroom training alone will not reach the scale of the effort defined by the CSO, which suggests about 16 to 18 per cent of the population. Any new interventions must be sustainable in order to provide the ongoing supports required to address and maintain inclusion in the digital world. Communities at the heart of everything we do, be it digital or otherwise. We are working across both departments to provide communities with a better chance of making choices for themselves. To succeed in developing communities where connectivity and uh, digitisation are a seamless part of, way of everyday life, partnerships between government departments, private industries and communities are needed. By working together and combining existing assets and resources under a shared vision, communities can maximise and reach their impact of, scheme, of schemes and programmes. The Smart Community Initiative is a new approach 
that will bring exposure to digital content and technology out into the community and support the discovery of, val the, val of the value of digital in the daily lives of people. With this in mind, the Department of Commun Communications, Climate Action and Environment, together with the Department of Rural and Community Development, engaged with senior representatives from organisations who had expressed an interest in this approach, such as the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection, Bank of Ireland, Musgraves, OnPost, HSC, the Library Services and the Local Government Management Agency, or the LGMA. All of these organisations demonstrated their willingness to be an active partner and, and, and a smart community action group was established. The group agreed that every community faces different challenges and identified four key pillars to be considered. One is basic skills, two is economic well-being, three is physical and mental well-being, and the fourth one is history, culture and heritage. The Action Group agreed to pilot the Smart Community Initiative in Turbercurry, County Sligo. Factors taken into account in selecting Turbercurry include the presence of strong, active community groups, a local presence by all stakeholders of the Action Group, the availability of high-speed broadband, the co-location of a post office and a super value, and the existence of an open library which has been funded by the Department of Rural and Community Development under the Library's Capital Programme. A Tubercurry Smart Community Committee was established to test the feasibility of the initiative and de develop a number of local activities. The committee organised a launch event for Tubercurry Smart Community on the 18th of January, which highlighted some of the supports available locally and the opportunities provided by embracing technology. One of these opportunities is the chance to promote Tubercurry as a remote working location. Ireland, like other countries, is being increasingly impacted by digital content and technology. 6% of Ireland's GDP and 116,000 jobs are accounted for by digital in the economy. The opportunities digital re represent for Ireland are significant. Ireland has the raw materials needed for success, including the presence of leading digital businesses, a young, educated, English-speaking workforce and high levels of international connectivity. The Tubercurry Smart Community Committee is working with a voluntary movement called Grow Remote to host a conference in Tubercurry on the 16th of April. Grow Remote is about connecting jobs to the people and creating a remote community. It is about choice. When jobs are, in mobile, are mobile, it provides opportunities for communities to compete. And I would like to welcome representatives here today uh, who will speak to you later. Well, in, well, in my remit, oh, what's going to happen next is that over the coming months, we will assess where possible what the impact of becoming a smart community is having on Tubercurry. Record, less, record lessons learned and develop criteria to identify key elements required to become a smart community and a set of metrics to be used to measure success. One pilot, though, is not sufficient to test and build a robust, sustainable initiative. And we are hoping to try this initiative in a further three locations this year. The locations chosen will include at least one urban location to ensure that the model used for establishing a smart community can be adapted to meet the different needs of communities nationwide. We will examine existing infrastructure, connectivity, and explore new ways of delivering government services to enhance the user's experience. To, to this end, the Department of Rural and Community Development, which co-funds the employment of a broadband officer in each local authority to the tune of 42,000 per local authority this year, will be key in rolling out further trials. I recently met with the broadband officers and senior officials from each local authority and impressed upon them that they will have to play a vital role in promoting the Smart Community Initiative and work to grow remote going forward. In summary, a smart community can be described as a community working together, supported by local and central government, to bring people and technology together in time to capture and exploit the opportunities that new applications of forward and broadband-based services can deliver. Such focused and united community efforts create synergy, which allows individual projects to build upon each other and provide a coherence to government supports and funding opportunities. Digital is not an end in itself, it is an enabler, and each community has a different story to tell. In order to develop a smart community, activities must be community-driven and supported by industry and by government. Thank you very much.
Thanks very much, uh, Minister. Uh, I now call on uh, Tracy Kyo to make her opening statement. You're very welcome, Tracy. Thank you, and, and thanks for having us here today. On behalf of our 40 chapters across the country, we really do welcome the opportunity, and in particular, Minister Kerry, for spending your evenings supporting our chapters on the ground uh, in Ennis. I have a fundamental belief in, in the power of community when you give it the space to be done right. And I was watching past these prior uh, sessions, and I know that you understand it too, and that you understand the challenges that we face. Um, so from the housing crisis to congestion to carbon tax, um, to releasing the pressure valve on our urban areas, to increasing the employment in, in rural Ireland and increasing the quality of that employment. So if you could think of decentralization again but for the private sector and by choice that is essentially what we think remote work can do you'll excuse me if I read I'm, I'm representing a large group so I'd like to make sure that I cover everything and um, in order to do that we think that we need to we work with three different groups so first of all is companies and SMEs their number one talent number one challenge the SFA will tell you is access to and retention of talent the second group that we work with is the talent themselves, and they will tell you, 77% in the Bodu and Vodafone survey, tell you that they want more uh, flexible uh, working policies in our Irish organisations. 50% of them in a Wicklow County Council survey of commuters want to work um, in their hometown. So the talent are pushing for it. And the third group, my most important group, are our community groups, who need to ensure the economic sustainability of vibrant community places and they're taking the actions and they're building the, the capabilities in-house to do it. So how do we drive more? That's where we started off with. Um, remote, work, remote working companies have identified remote work in itself as a skill. So the first thing that we need to do is uncover our hugely talented uh, workforce in Ireland that are already skill, skilled up in remote work. And, and use that through Grow Remote as a place that we can point to to locate that talent locally. Our group in Grow Remote have gone one step further on that. We've introduced a free scholarship programme um, with, an, with an accredited uh, certification in remote work that trains up people across uh, Ireland um, in, the, in this skill. By creating jobs in the regions you'll know, we release the pressure valve on our major urban areas. Now, many people will tell you that our broadband isn't sufficient in rural Ireland. <clears throat> For sure it's not, but it is not an inhibitor currently to big organisations hiring in the most rural parts of Ireland. So Grow Remote itself, how did it get started? Um, we started as a kind of a mobilised group of co-working managers, employers and employees who saw an opportunity. We slowly evolved into an organisation that has the structure to deliver this uh, nationally and locally. We have 40 chapters across Ireland, uh, one in Spain, one in Portugal, one in the USA also. We didn't anticipate that scale, but what we did figure out is that we hit upon a fundamental need of enabling our communities to thrive, and scaling was a natural uh, next step. So, what are we finding so far? Uh, there's a telecommunications company called Blueface. They did a survey. They found uh, 216,000 uh, remote workers in Ireland. And the first thing that we want to do is deeply understand that number and try and see it locally. So who are they? Who do they work for? What are their skills? Um, and that is our first job. And in a, in a recent meetup just this month, in a very rural location, we had Dell, Pfizer, Wafer, Wafer Shopify, GitHub and um, GitHub and what was the last one? GitHub and Hotjar in that location. Those are companies that don't necessarily hire there, but those people are living in that community, working in that community and contributing directly to that local community. I know that when we mention rural jobs and when I was listening back, we think of SMEs. That, that's what we think of. I suppose I'm not asking to, to let go of the SMEs at all. Um, at, that, at that rural meetup, a man stood up. His name is John Horkin. He is owner of the Horkin Garden Centre, employs 150 people, Mayo born and bred company. And he spoke about how he was surprised to see the vast variety of skills that were in that room and how seeing that is actually fundamental to supporting the Horkin Garden Centre on their own digital trans transformation journey to ensure that that SME is sustainable for that community. So, um, 
Grow Remote as a whole, what do we do? I suppose the idea at the heart of Grow Remote is quite simple. We bridge the gap between remote work and local impact. Um, our focus is on remote work uh, full-time employees. So all the same benefits that you get with a local employer simply without the office. And we separate our, the suppliers of remote work into two streams. Your fully distributed companies, no offices, and then the companies who we say are on the journey. So they have ad hoc policies. They'll say, we'll let you go and work in Casa Bar or Tune, but they don't um, have a unified approach to it where they hire remotely. And we are seeing that. So, co so companies such as, such as Shopify, Buffer, 10Up, they're moving towards a trend of having no offices whatsoever. So how do we bridge the gap? Um, we operate in chapters um, on, a, on a platform called ChangeX and what that does in textbook community development in my mind, it equips communities with the tools and resources to make change in their own environment and that's what they're doing. And our chapters now range from Aramore Island uh, with a population of 465 people up to Dublin and Lisbon and they can all support each other in enabling each other between them to thrive. So why are we doing this? It's relatively obvious, but there's two main points. The first one is economic, economic, bringing economic life back to rural Ireland. So people need to be able to have high quality jobs in rural places and they need to be able to spend that money back into the local community. They want to do that, we just need to enable it. And the second one is where is actually the perspective that we came from. So regional hubs are popping up all over the country, like everywhere. And they started off with a focus on startups and, and maybe um, anchor tenants and, and SMEs. We believe that the final pillar to, to enabling these uh, regional hubs to thrive is remote work and people who wish to work remotely, not necessarily within their own homes. That obviously aids in, in the bigger point of these hubs, which is bringing back life back into the main street and central areas of our towns and villages. So, um, what is your role in, in supporting Grow Remote? Joe, jo, you asked us that question. Um, <clears throat> number one, we would like to commission an in-depth study um, into the opportunities remote working presents. Um, the challenges currently faced by companies um, wishing to pursue this as a, as a strategy, and that's our first ask. Um, number two is, we would like to see solid cooperation across government agencies on the topic of remote work. Um, we, while we have really positive engagement with government bodies on an informal basis, we're asking this committee um, to, to ask the government agencies responsible for job creation and beyond that, you know, your into carbon emissions and all of that kind of side, to work closely with our th team and grow remote as we deliver the necessary supports. So look, to recap, um, we need to show the as part of kind of changing the art of, of rural Ireland, we need to show the abundance of jobs that are in the most rural place in, in Ireland. The jobs that don't come with a ribbon cut. So they don't come the way we're usually associated, we usually associate them with. And they are in brilliant international firms like Shopify, Wayfair, Trello, Buffer, 10Up, Scraping Up, Nearform More. So if you think of a town in Ireland that has a pub, a shop and a GAA pitch, and you're growing up there, thinking of Ballandarian in Galway, and you think, I can be a public and an undertaker or a primary school teacher. I want you always also to think, I can work for Expedia, I can work for Shopify, I can work for Wayfair. And just because we're no longer seeing them on the main street does not mean that, that you can't have really brilliant uh, career opportunities with these companies. I know that the win-win is, is usually too good to be true, um, but this is already happening in, in, in areas across Ireland. It's a win for employers. They're seeing increased productivity. They're seeing uh, better brands uh, for, to, to attract new employees. Um, it's a win for employees, productive, happier, all of that stuff. And it's a huge win for our communities and that enables the rest to grow more. While it is not a silver bullet and is not the single solution, to our changing world of work and life. It is a smart, effective, economically viable solution that is yet to be fully embraced um, and to go mainstream by employers, employees um, and communities. I suppose the question is, what else do we have in our arsenal to drive um, job creation in Ireland? And is, is, is one of those pieces driving remote work as a serious uh, a solution? 
while I'm here, a couple of weeks ago we launched uh, uh, the Tubber Curry, um, to grow remote in Tubber Curry with a fantastic local team and a brilliant track record in, in delivery. Uh, but I'd like to thank the, de de the, sorry, the Department of Communications for their forward thinking and proactive approach to supporting that community on the ground and behind the scenes um, and enabling us to thrive. In particular, Caroline Henry, Stephen Brennan and Minister Canny. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Tracy. Um, I, the first person that indicated was uh, Senator Coffey. I'll bring in then. Yeah, Coffey. thank you, Chairman. Uh, and, and first of all, I want to welcome um, all of the witnesses to, to, to the committee this morning. Um, apologies. Um, uh, I think this is it's something that obviously interests all very deeply in, in, in rural Ireland in terms of, of uh, I suppose, how we can grow uh, enterprise, how we can enhance uh, social inclusion and all of those things for those of us that do live in rural Ireland. And I needn't tell, tell the Minister, he's been on this side of the table um, advocating for rural Ireland and I, and I know you're, you're passionate about it. And I think this is an interesting engagement this morning because I think for once we're starting to think outside the box. Uh, rather than going through the traditional I suppose, streams of, you know, how, how will we get the networks out into rural Ireland for broadband and all of that, which is all very important work, infrastructure, you know, the, the various aspects of wireless broadband connectivity through the new initiatives like CSIRO and the ESB, trying to look at different ways rather than the hard fibre that we've traditionally delivered fi um, broadband in, in urban areas. So that, that's all happening in the background, but in the meantime, uh, I think it's refreshing to hear uh, Grow Remote and Tracy outline uh, how she and her, 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 her colleagues are thinking outside the box, utilising existing infrastructure and getting ahead of the game in terms of engaging with employers, government departments, this committee, agencies and others. And I want to commend her on that and, and, and your colleagues as well. But I don't think it should stop there. Um, you mentioned a few things there, Tracy, in your presentation about power of community and quality of life which are the traditional strengths of rural Ireland. And I think we need to capture those, and I think that's what you're saying, uh, but I suppose direct them in a way that, um, I suppose, benefits jobs, allows people to live at home, allows people to earn an income, and allows people to contribute to the local communities. Yeah. That's it in, in, in a nutshell, as far as what, what I'm getting from you. Um, and just a couple of questions. You, you mentioned enablers, and I think this is where, I suppose, this committee needs to try and help in, in identifying enablers to make what your aspirations are, which I think are very commendable, how we can make those work. Um, you mentioned one of them was as regional hubs and access to those. Um, and you also mentioned about uh, commissioning a study uh, for, op for further opportunities. And co I could ask you just to elaborate on that a bit further, distill it down a bit and say, you know, what specifically, uh, um, obviously opportunities are engagement with employers. You know, do we get those into to a committee like this or do we try and assist you in engaging them through your chapters in various, you know, SMEs, ISME, um, you know, Retail Ireland, all of the all of the representative agencies that are out there, and the larger brands and companies that you mention also. So identify some of the enablers that maybe we can assist you with, if you wouldn't mind. Um, also, the, the 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 other question I have was, um, and I suppose this is directed at the minister, and and I think to recognise minister the role you can play in, I suppose, being the champion for initiatives like this across government, because as we all know. Um, Government can often work in silos, uh, departments, 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 and it's very hard to get that cross-cut of recognition uh, of where initiatives like this can work. Uh, and what I mean by that is, number, number one, the delivery of broadband, which is access to digital. Uh, I think that's the first thing, and I think, Minister, you and your colleagues are, are doing your best now to enhance that. But to engage then, say, the likes of the Department of Enterprise um, and to encourage uh, officials and representatives in that organisation to engage with us to look at how we can assist um, uh, the likes of Grow Remote, because there's huge potential here if it's managed in a coordinated way, uh, uh, I believe. Uh, and I'm quite excited to hear that there's so much work going on behind the scenes. We need to see more of it. Uh, and I think, Chairman, down the road, maybe in this committee, if we could identify some actions out of today's presentations to see could we call in other agencies, departments, or, or employer representatives or whoever to see how we can channel them into thinking about Grow Remote, how we can think of 
uh, improving prospects for job creation in rural Ireland, I think we would be doing a job as a committee in that sense. So just to thank the, the, the present, the, those that made the presentation, I'd just be here, interested to hear some of the responses. Gormagot. Thanks very much, Senator. Um, I, I'd like to ask Tracy or Paul um, or Minister to, to address some of the questions there that um, Senator had. Senator, thank you very much for your kind words. Um, much appreciated. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take first uh, the report. We, there, there's lots of things that could be done. So we have an e-workers grant, for instance, that is very hard for remote workers, to, for remote working companies to administer. It's not well promoted. There, there's various things, but I suppose instead of coming here asking you for one-off pieces like that, or there's an e-visa that Estonia do really, really well, um, there's other models that we can take from different countries. We would like to open it up a little bit broader and make sure, I suppose, the ask that we, that the st things that we're asking for are, are viable and, and will impact in a meaningful way. So the study is essentially to understand the, the, the landscape that we have currently. So that, for instance, that figure around 216,000 workers, that's a pretty big figure. Is that the case or not? You know, and can we delve a little bit deeper into that? And then, are there any infrastructural challenges that the government can work on to support companies to hire outside of cities and more remote? So I suppose that's kind of what we want to do. It's, it's quite broad. Um, but I think as soon as you begin to start speaking to the companies that we're speaking to, that will start to firm up to you. People have been thinking about this. They haven't had the opportunity, like, like, like we've been given today, to come here. So I think as soon as uh, we open up that, that, that gateway, uh, you'll have floods. Um, I'll pass the next piece, baby, on to Paul. Sure. I'll just say... companies in global jobs. They started in EMEA, Europe, Middle East, Africa, as well as global roles when I lived in, in Dunleary, moved down to Clare in 2007. Now, I was able to do that because of the trust and the relationship, not with my employer overall, but with my manager. And what I find is that uh, while we see more people building those relationships and that trust, it's still not at a point, the culture and the trust within organizations that really enable this to be pervasive to the, to the potential that we have today. In terms of what the government can do to support, there's still this perception that remote working is about converting a spare bedroom into a home office and, and hope to God that, uh, that you have good broadband. The co-working spaces and how the government and local organizations can support that that you're coming together in a co-working space, you have all of the social interaction and, and the vibrancy for the community, but yet you're connected with your customers, with your employers, with your employees, anywhere in the world, literally anywhere in the world. So encouraging those spaces, and as Tracy had noted, going beyond just the mindset of this is for small startups and you know trying to create brand new businesses, that's definitely a piece of it. But there are, are so many people around the country and around the world that have the capability to work in remote spaces to make their communities vibrant if they're given that opportunity and, and the process and the trust is built with their employers and with the community as well. Thanks, Paul. Uh, just, in just certain things, uh, um, you are right, no department should be working in a silo. And um, I think the example of the Tubber Curry um, uh, smart uh, community is that there, there are a number of groups who have come together and agencies. Um, and, for instance, when I was down there with Sligo IT, where they are very active as well, so education comes into it. But going back to um, what uh, is being said about Grow Remote, I do know that um, the IDA will tell me and have told me that FDIs now want to know that their workers can work from home, but not necessarily from the house. They can work from Tubber Curry or from Toom or from Ballandarine or Gart or whatever it be, they can, they, they can come there, they can work, and then they can drive three miles home, pick, you know, they have a better quality of life, and we're saving a huge amount on um, transport costs, uh, emissions, the whole, the whole thing. So when Tracy talks about win-win, and, and I was really taken by uh, what I saw in Trouble Curry in terms of collective responsibility and collective action by a lot of people, and then to meet with the um, Tracy and, and her, her group that I believe wholeheartedly that I am 
that we're, we're working on something that will make a huge difference to rural Ireland. And we don't necessarily, necessarily have, and, and you've said it, Tracy, is the lack of broadband in rural Ireland is not an inhibitor. Uh, because we have, if we have places in towns right now that can actually uh, take up uh, the slack, we will actually be able to de develop the jobs and keep the jobs in the towns and in the villages. And that's, that's, that's the first step. Rural broadband is another issue, but I, I, I am uh, totally committed to this, and I will be talking to other departments to explain to them what's going on here and get their input and I suppose to let them know what's going on, which is a big thing that's often missing, that people, some departments don't know what's happening in the other department. And it might be all good things, mm -hmm. and people are wondering how they will do something that's already been done. Yeah. Thanks, Minister. Yeah. Minister, uh, Deputy Mark McKinney, please. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. It's most interesting this morning. Um, a couple of things. First of all, the, 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 the chapters and how they are set up and what, what mechanism, <laughs> basically, a community project or a community group goes to in order to, to engage with that and to look at that. Um, I'm in South Leitrim and uh, while Carrick and Shannon has good broadband and is the place where everything is happening, I would say that there's very little. And that's one of the difficulties we have. And I know, like for instance, um, where I live out in a rural parish, we have a pub, a shop, uh, used to be a post office, not there anymore, we're not going down that road today. Uh, we have, we have a, a football field and a school which was a three teacher school and unless we get another 16 children by next September it will be a two teacher school and once it goes to a two teacher school it's on the way out. And that's the experience in many rural parishes around the country where there isn't a town and there's loads of them. And uh, from Mohol out to, to Ahavas there's on the top of the poles there's a wire running all the way along and it's supposed to be the broadband wire. Well, it's there three years and there's no broadband. And that's the same in very, very many places. And while I absolutely rejoice in what you're coming telling us, you know, we've heard so much of this for so long that so many rural communities are just disheartened and saying, look, they've given up the ghost and have tried so much that they find it very difficult. So I would very much like to get um, some detail as to, as to how those, these chapters can work, as to what what real businesses can actually come and how people can live at home in the rural area and go to the small village or town near them and, and, and work from there. If, if that's what you're saying can happen and that there's a market for that, that there's actually something real that can be done and, and, and that can, can change this thing around, wonderful. But we are hesitant in believing in it because we've heard so much promise, to be honest, in the past. And the... the um, the other issue is, you know, how to make this happen. Communities have come together and have worked so hard for so long uh, to try and make things happen and, you know, ha have generally ended up that, that, that these little development organisations have just become social clubs and, and, and little at the end of it. And, and that, that needs to change. And, and if, this, if you're saying that there's an opportunity here in regard to that, that can make it happen. First of all, we need to get these, these broadband that's running along the top of these poles actually live and working. That's, that's the first thing we need to do. And we need to get the, 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 not just the one or two major towns in each county having good broadband. We need to get it out into everywhere. And I, and I don't expect it to go down every boreen. You know, we're not, people in rural Ireland are stupid either. You know, we, need, we understand that. But we do need to get a decent level of broadband to most places. Uh, we need to see that, that if the opportunity for remote working and for, for, uh, for people living at home, what you're saying basically is through many of the multinational companies or, or reasonably well established companies, if that's there, uh, how do we access it? How do you put the, the ABC? How do we do this? Yeah. And, and we, need to, we need to see that, that framework. And, and actually she, see proof of concept yeah. because we are so sick of having concepts and reports telling us how things can be done. But when it comes to it, nothing happens. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the reality for so, so many people living in rural areas where they have a three-teacher school going down to a two-teacher and they want to change that. I'll also call a Deputy Anne Rabbit. Thank you, Thank you very much. Sorry I wasn't here for your presentation, but I was watching it from the office. I think Tracy knows of who I am because a good friend of mine, Mary Fahey, in Portumna has a lot of work done in relation to remote. And I think this week we were about to run it out of my office in the hub in Portumna in relation to remote. Mary is also a chapter leader um, for, for Grow Remote. 
So I'm well versed in the whole aspect of Grow Remote and I have to say I mentioned it on one t tonight show yes, one night yes. and it was the best LinkedIn retweet I ever got on LinkedIn because really people who are in on this understand what it's all about and they see the value out of it. And, but what we have to do is help and assist in getting the word out there as to how actually it can be done. And I think Minister Kenny is, is very right in what you're saying is that we have to encourage communities as to how to work together because the simple reason being is a lot of it has to do with people don't want to be in their own office or in their own house day in, day out because there's a certain amount of loneliness attached to it. I think employers get a comfort from the fact that if they know if there's communal working taking place. And I suppose one of the questions I have for Minister Canny is, in relation to leader funding, do you think under what is left within the leader, is there an opportunity or capacity for, for the chapters if they were to identify buildings that leader funding could be ring-fenced? Because I think this is a, a growing entity. In relation to Galway ourselves, like Abbey Community got awarded 50,000 under town and villages renewal to convert their, their unit, their community centre in Abbey to put it in a digital hub to allow people from that area because we know that there's black spots down in Banley Hill but that doesn't preclude them from coming five miles down the road to work from. So it's in relation to the leader funding I think it's a great opportunity if we could identify areas through the chapter's experience of areas throughout your communities where we could ring fence where project, properties could be identified Chapters could be the, manage, the lever to accessing the funding to d delivering that whole community experience. And Tracy, in relation to yourself, is um, your background, you, your grow remote, would I assume you work for an industry or do you work for an organisation? I do, I work for an organisation, yes. So our, our whole organisation was started in a volunteer capacity. So you work, what organisation do you work I for? I work for Bank of Ireland. All right, so Bank of Ireland would be a key driver in giving you the opportunity to get businesses out and to promote businesses that you obviously do, you do business with, or is that how it is operates? No, no, it's just, it's totally, it's totally separate. So it started off as a, a grassroots movement and built of its own, own accord, and it is what, is what it is today. All right, all right, because I'm just trying to understand how do we promote what jobs, because at the moment, yeah, yeah. from what I can understand, there's about 10,000 jobs available. If I was to, when I open up on Saturday morning below in the hub in Portona, I will be able to educate people if they walk into to, to the office and we're doing mm. our, or we could do it in Super Value or wherever, yeah, yeah. Um, to promote how many jobs are available. Am I correct in saying there's about 10,000 jobs there available? I think 10,000 might be too much, but there, there's, there's, there's hundreds. And like on one side alone, no desk, there's hundreds. And people aren't aware of that. And this is a good news story that we need to be telling more about. Yeah. All right. Paul, would you agree with me in what I'm saying in relation to leader? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, the joint through the chair. Oh, sorry. And, My apologies. Um, oh, thanks for your tolerance. But um, we also have Deputy Kenny as well. He was in before oh. you. So, you know, you, you might be able to respond. Yeah. There were lots of, of, of pieces there, Minister Kenny. Um, <clears throat> uh, your office is in Manor Hamilton, if I'm right, am I? One in Manor Hamilton okay. and one in Carrigan Channel. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Manor Hamilton is actually one of the areas where this started for me personally. So I was in with Ronan Hazlitt, who uh, converted his, his um, building into a co-working space for Manor Hamilton, yeah. called it Manor Hub. He is... He works all over the world. He, he's a fantastic guy and he has such conviction and passion for his community. And I was thinking, how am I supposed to support this? It's, it's so difficult. Like, it's not, it's not an easy win. Um, and so that's where it started. So I understand that communities have been at this for a while, because we are the community, right, that have been at it for a while, and that it may be heard some things, you know, and, and some things don't happen. That's kind of part and parcel of community at the same time. Um, I suppose what Grow Remote has done is taken the energy from all across, from Tullamore to Gorey to Cork to Valencia Island, Aramore Island, um, and, and brought it together in a structure where we can get it to you and say, here's our coherent set of asks. And I suppose that's the difference between the likes of us and then, you know, the, 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 the risk of it turning into a social club. And on that note in particular, I, I'll just mention that when I was listening back to the committees, I heard uh, one man in particular speak about the importance of social enterprise in communities. Absolutely. And you strengthen your groups by training them up and building competent communities. And that's what we need. And I suppose I'll push that one back, back to you and, and the committee and say, 
us as communities need more help in structuring, structuring our thoughts and opinions and the actions that we want to take in a way that, 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 that we can work with you in. We've been greatly supported by Social Entrepreneurs Ireland and I think without John Avoy being on the other end of a call to me I would have been fairly stuck. Um, so, so that's kind of how we structured it that way. Sorry, now there was a lot in it. There's one more piece. Um, a, you asked about chapters. So we went to Change X and basically we said, look, this is what every community needs to do. We built the guide to finding remote work. So you said, you know, we don't know where to find it. You're right. 64% of people say that they don't work remotely because they don't know where to find the work. They're not listed on the same job sites that they are in uh, for other jobs. So it was a core part of what we did. Got all of those tools together, went on to Change X. Communities who want to do something literally apply to, they read five steps, they take the five steps, they set up a chapter, and that's kind of how it happens. So it's pretty structured in that regard, and ChangeX are a tremendous organisation um, to enable that. Um, I think it was, did you read the article Pat Spillane wrote um, in, I don't know what paper it was? So public. No, was it Irish Times? So he spoke about how, um, he speak about the schools and the three kids and three teachers. Um, Pat Spillane spoke about how when something goes wrong in rural Ireland, we say it's dying, right? Or uh, we must go to Dublin, Dublin must fix our problems. What a com and he, Pat Spillane in that article wrote a piece about a, com a community kilty um, and about how they went, this is our reality. These are our restrictions. Now, with that, what can we do? And they, they got the school reopened. So th there are proactive things that we can do rather than, um, rather than sitting back or being worried that we might fail. And that's around supporting, equipping our communities with the tools and resources to make their own change. Um, I think that was um, really all of your questions from my side, if I'm right. Just to first of all, um, Deputy Kinney, when you talk about the, the fibre running along the poles and it's, it's not live, uh, I had a meeting this morning with the telecommunications industry and um, they have a clear understanding of what I want them to do. But just to say to you that I would um, say that if there's a specific thing like that, and I've said it in the doll before, and Minister Bruton said it, that if you contact the Department of Climate and um, Communications with that specific problem, we will get that checked out for you. It's not acceptable. Um, just, just uh, Deputy Ann, Robert, what you're talking about there was about Clore, right? And then you mentioned the town and village. Mm. So what I would say is the department that I work in have a, a number of streams of funding that can be applied for. Uh, and more importantly, we have the uh, Rural Regeneration Fund, which, which is there. Uh, the, 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 there's a huge amount of opportunities that if there are buildings uh, that are... Uh, are can be identified, mm -hmm. and if, they, if they're public buildings or if they're private buildings, uh, how they can be brought back into use. But we also have, uh, and rather than reinvent the wheel, yeah. where we have libraries, we have a tool, we have a network, and we have, for instance, uh, around, we are now putting in the, uh, the funding into uh, the digital enhancement of the libraries, so that these libraries can remain open uh, they're called open libraries. We have them open from 8 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night and you have you get your card and you have remote access and you can go into the libraries. That's been rolled out at the moment. Trevor Corey has it and within that particular um, uh, day I was down there, the senior citizens were being um, in there um, training up on the computers. They were going online to see where they would go the next holidays. Uh, they were uh, they were being trained on how to do emails, how to access all of this, so that they they are not left behind in the communities in the digital age. So we have a huge amount happening, um, but sometimes people say, "Oh, we should get a building." There's a building, there's a, there's a, a libraries in in lots of places, a network of them, and we should be utilising them more. They shouldn't be just open from nine to five and closed uh, after that. And we we are doing that. That's been done at the moment, and I think that's the type of, of initiative we have now, and I suppose forward thinking that, that we're going to utilise the assets we have rather than saying we have nothing. And I think by, by doing that, we will, create, uh, we will create the spaces where we can do this. And also, uh, yes, if there's a, uh, villages that may have buildings that don't have the libraries, well, then we can use uh, uh, the LCDs, uh, can uh, look at the funding through, through the... Um, the CLAW funding, there's, there's town and village renewal, there's community enhancement projects, 
as well as the rural regeneration. So we have lots of opportunities uh, and the, the, the funding streams are there uh, and, and will be of uh, great assistance uh, uh, for places like that, that that we all know about. And we can see these buildings closed up for years. We can open them up and we can get them working again. And, th and that is what's happening. And we've also piloted, f I think it's six villages in the country at the moment where we're doing, we've given them money to, for the community themselves to go along and come up with a, a scheme for what they want to do to regenerate their town. And they probably will come up with six different proposals for each town. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because each, not every town is the same. Their mm -hmm. needs and their wants are different. Yeah. So that's what we have done with that. And I think when we get that back, and that's true through the rural regeneration, I think, the town yep. of it, rural regeneration. So again, it's another initiative which is saying, rather than Dublin telling, telling you this is what we're going to give you in, in, in Toom or Claremorris or wherever you, you, you have, what we're saying is, no, let you, we give you the money to create the plan for what you want. Bring that back up to us and we'll try and fund that. It's a different approach. It's a bottom-up approach. Yep, perfect. Thanks very much, Minister. Um, just, uh, I, I'd like to welcome you here. Um, I, I went to a chapter meeting in Clare, uh, in Clare Castle, and I, I saw how this works, which is incredible. And I have to compliment Tracy and Paul for, um, for doing this, because you're making a real difference. Mm -hmm. And like every rural community in Ireland can benefit from Grow Remote. And it's such a simple idea, but it just works really. And it's about, you know, bringing everything together. Um, and I think Paul, you hit on it there. Like, you need a structure there. And Minister Kenny there, he was talking about town and village and Clar and other, say, revenue sources. But if we had one sort of package, you know, that like there's 40 different chapters in Ireland and abroad. Uh, but if, if you had a package, if you could put it together where, you know, Grow Remote could link in with SMEs or multinational companies, Paul touching as well, like a culture of trust uh, between the employee and the employer, that you're working remotely from your house or a, a co-working space. Um, you know, if you can bring that all together in one package, I think that's what you need to do. Um, because urban sprawl is, is what we have here in Dublin. Um, I, I think Dublin would benefit from this as well. You know, less people would be commuting to Dublin, housing in Dublin, pressure on schools, whatever else. You know, I think working remotely, um, you know, is the way to go. But I am... Um, I know, Tracy, you, you mentioned there about doing an in-depth mm. you know, report yeah. in relation to, say, working remotely. Mm. And I, I, I don't know, I, I think the committee, we, we should examine that proposal and take it on board and look at the challenges and the barriers and the different issues that are there to, yeah. to, to grow your, your, yourselves even more. Um, and I think it's all about really linking in um, you know, what you have to offer and, and companies out there. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, there's a work-life balance as well, you know, and I, like, I love County Clare. Um, it's the best county in Ireland. And uh, it, it, it is, it is now, Minister. Um, <laughs> if you could live in Clare and work in Clare, um, I think it's the best place to be, you know. And, like, working remotely, you know, that you can achieve that. Um, and just listen to Paul there, like he works for a, a global, you know, serious company and he's working from Clare Castle in County Clare and he does that from home. And I went to the, that chapter meeting mm -hmm. last tour of the week in Clare Castle, in my own village, and to see the amount of people that were there that came mm -hmm. that night, they're serious players mm -hmm. and they're working remotely from home. Mm -hmm. But it's to try and join that up um, and get that message out. And that's why and I'd like to thank the members um, for agreeing to, to, to have this meeting today and, and for having me up here. Um, because we need to get this out 
you know, and publicise the work that you're doing mm -hmm. in conjunction with the Department and, and Minister, Minister Kenny. So um, this gives you that opportunity. Um, but mm -hmm. I would certainly agree with the proposal that you have in relation to a report uh, in relation to uh, remote working. And um, just thank you again. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call on who's, who's in uh, Senator Hopkins and uh, Deputy Smith then, okay? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I apologise, I was, I was a little bit late, I had another meeting, um, but I, I suppose I've got a lot from the, the questions and, and answers section. Um, I, I suppose I'll just speak about my own experience in Roscommon, Galway. Um, I, I attended um, the launch of a digital hub attached to the library in Ballinasloe um, at the end of January. Um, and obviously it's very positive, um, BACD, so Ballinasloe and Community Development Association are very proactive in encouraging the exact goals that you're talking about with regard to um, trying to work with companies to ensure that a number of employees could benefit from working in this space. Um, because we all know the challenges of travelling to Galway City or Dublin or wherever on a daily basis. Um, and Galway County Council are obviously very supportive of this initiative as well. Um, and I suppose at this launch as well, um, the Minister will be aware of Michael Burke, who is the CEO of the Chanel Group. Um, he, he was involved in, in launching this and trying to promote it. Um, and it has been there for, for maybe the best part of a year, a year and a half. Um, they had their first client at the end of um, 2018 for a number of weeks. Um, but my main point is there is huge potential there. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we're har har harnessing it enough. Um, we talk a lot about the infrastructure that's needed, but the infrastructure is there. Um, and it is space which could work for many people. I will also give the example of um, our fabulous new Aris and Kunde building in Roscommon Town. Um, they similarly have a digital hub attached to that. Again, there is a lot more potential than is being currently utilised to support people to live in rural areas, to enjoy the quality of life that we all, um, I suppose, promote um, and enjoy. Um, my point really is, um, and, it's, and it's to the Minister and to um, the other um, individuals on, on the panel today, what can we do, or we should be doing more, to try and ensure the um, fabulous hub over the library in Ballinasloe, mm. the digital hub in Roscommon Town, is being utilised to its maximum potential. And we're not doing that currently. Um, I suppose all of us want to be proactive, we want to work on the resources that we, we have or the resources that we can deliver on, but these are resources that are there, that's infrastructure that is there. So, you know, obviously we need to communicate that out wider. I was quite interested in what Paul said in relation to how um, how he began working from home and that I suppose his boss, his manager, worked quite closely to encourage that. Um, what more do we need to be doing in terms of our work with companies okay. to allow them to know about the potential of these hubs? And I, I'm only speaking about the ones in, in my region. But I know they're underutilised, and I strongly believe more needs to be done um, to encourage employers or entrepreneurs to set up and benefit um, from the really good facilities that are currently there in rural areas. Um, so obviously, I'm, I'm working, I'm working closely with. Um, with BACD um, and working closely in Roscommon to promote that. Um, but th there is another piece of work that needs to be done to finish off this jigsaw given the infrastructure 
that is there. So I would appreciate, um, I suppose, a response in, in relation to that main point. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Deputy Smith. Thank the Minister and Tracy for their presentations here this morning. Um, you know, for once it sounds like a really positive story and something very exciting with huge potential for our communities and for those of us uh, living in rural Ireland. And we do always tend to, I suppose, focus on the negative, like the closure of the post offices and all that. And they do have, I suppose, a physical disadvantage. They present a physical disadvantage as we see it and, and as we perceive it to be. Um, you know, we see it as, as another very important building, business, um, opportunity for foot Fall, an opportunity to bring people into our towns and villages gone. And I'm thinking of towns like Kinnalek and Kilishandra um, that would have been affected by that. But then there's other small towns that probably, you know, face difficulties, but as you pointed out, Tracy, different types of difficulties. Um, towns like Belturban and Bonboy that are potentially you know, in the realm of losing, or on the cusp of losing a secondary school in both of those towns in West Cavan, which is a really scary thing for any town or village to be facing the potential of losing that youth, th that footfall, the, 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 the families that travel to those towns, and of course those children, students circulating and the staff circulating in those towns and villages at the moment. So I suppose my point really is that the presentation you bring here today is something that I seem re feel is very positive, something I'd like to know more about, uh, to compliment uh, the Minister who has obviously been hugely involved in this and, um, you know, I I'd be interested to see where your other chapters are because I'm not aware of this. Have you a chapter in Cavan or Monaghan? Um, they'd be my area. I think, you know, your message here today has been that there's two elements that are fundamental in the success of this and that is community and communication. And we see it in all of our towns and villages around the country where there's lots of voluntary groups, be it the De Town Development Association, the Tidy Towns, the Community Alerts, all doing different jobs that are really important, that are the glue that keep our communities you know, held and stuck together. And I think what you're presenting today here is an opportunity to, to bring all of those under the one roof, under the one umbrella, and more importantly, to provide jobs in our, in our small towns and villages. Um, we see how, and well, I see it personally every day on the on the N3 travelling up and down to Dublin. We're back to commuter crisis, if you like, where so much and, and commuting is what kills people and diminishes, you know, quality family life and family time because so many hours are spent in cars. It is for us in Cavan Monaghan because we don't have trains. That's not an option. So people are sitting in their cars for two and three hours to get to work every day, two and three hours to get home, and they're they're exhausted by the time they get home. And they haven't got that quality time to spend with their young children or their spouses or whomever. So I suppose really what I'm saying is I do think it's really positive. I wondered if you could maybe expand on what my colleague Deputy Anne Rabbit raised today about in terms of funding opportunities that may be there to, I suppose, embrace all of this. Uh, are our Leos from our local authorities involved in, in, in what you're doing here? Um, and I just wonder if there's been any gender breakdown in terms of the um, breakdown of females or males that are benefiting from this, because as I would see it, there's a huge opportunity for women uh, in all of this. Um, women who have great career prospects ahead of them, but that has to be put on hold because of childcare expenses. And as we know, for most families, childcare can be as expensive and perhaps more expensive than their mortgage. Therefore, couples have to weigh up, is it um, sensible for both in the family to be working. So potentially women are the untapped um, human capital resource, human resources that can be, you know, really expanded on here and, you know, prof perhaps provides a platform for women in terms of um, working remotely. So I just wonder, has there been any studies done, have we any figures on that in, in terms of the gender breakdown of who be benefits most from this? Um, yeah, and as I suppose, um, I do think you're right, Tracy, we tend to sort of jump on the bandwagon of the things that are wrong in our communities, and I think what you're presenting here today is probably an opportunity for communities to look down, and as you have quite rightly said, Minister, 
every town is unique in terms of what their disadvantages is, but also in terms of what their advantages is. Perhaps they're close to a motorway, perhaps they've got the, the, the school in the locality, perhaps they have a Calvin or Monaghan Institute in their town that provides the, you know, the young um, students coming out and, and, and you know, ordinarily would be see their opportunities having to go to Galway, having to go to Dublin, having to go to Belfast. Well, perhaps what you're presenting here today is jobs for them to tap into in their communities that will keep what is most important for our rural communities, and that is to keep people in them. So I suppose my, my, my two questions are, are you working with Leos? What other funding opportunities are there for Grow Remotely to tap into? The gender breakdown, um, and I suppose the, the, the notion that, you know, all of this is, 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 is key to this is communication because, as I said, we have lots of voluntary groups working within our communities, tend not to be communicating with each other, but all with the same, you know, passionate heart to do, to and better, um, better for the betterment of their communities. And I just, I suppose, I see this as the vehicle maybe to do this through what you're suggesting. And perhaps you could expand on that. Thanks, Stephanie Smith. To be okay, do you want to come in there? No, I'll keep going. You okay? Um, there's a number of questions there, Minister Tracy, Paul. You, you, could you address some of them, please? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take this. Um, Banla Slow, um, um, so did you, was, was, that em was that empty for a year and a half? Was that without tenants? Is that what you said? Approximately. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of, the, one of the reasons, Grow Remote had many catalysts, but that was one. So for some hubs in Ireland are not at full occupancy, and they need to be at about 60% occupancy to break even to sustain themselves financially. And what people, sometimes people are quick to go, they don't work. We don't have the luxury of saying they don't work in rural Ireland. They need to work, so they're just on a journey. What you mentioned there about um, a, that hub targeting a company who could base a, a, a bunch of employees in their, in their area, they're probably looking at satellite offices, which is one stream. But if you look at the bigger trends, companies are going without offices. So um, what, what some companies are finding is that they're getting a lot of towns coming to them. So the Burn will go, Banlaslow will go, Lockray, Portumna, all asking these companies to open up satellite offices. And it's quite hard for them to, 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 do, to make that happen. So I suppose that's one of the reasons kind of supporting that, a space like that is exactly where Grow Remote came about. Um, in terms of enabling them to reach their full potential, they're definitely not there yet in a lot of instances. There's one of our chapters in Terman and Donegal is actually working on an EU-funded project um, to, uh, that is focused on how co-working spaces in rural areas enable rural areas to thrive, and they're building that blueprint. So I suppose, back to your point as well and what I'm hearing again and again, building competent communities and enabling sharing of case studies and, and things that work between those communities. Um, there's also another organisation in Ireland who are working on that blueprint. I assume that that will be out around the middle of this year, and that will help them say, look, this is best practice, let's take that, and then let's take this little bit that's only relevant to our kind of area. Um, on the chapters, and thank you for your kind words on it, you, you fundamentally get, uh, I think, our bigger mission and our purpose behind it. Um, you can see all of the chapters uh, and locations of where we are on changex.org forward slash grow remote forward slash locations. Um, so we're everywhere. We have one in Monaghan. And to give you an example, I was there yesterday. Um, tremendous local council in Monaghan, like so, so forward thinking. But um, so I sat down and this is my first question to every community. Do you know who Wayfair is? No. And I'm like, that's why the jobs aren't here. The difference between you knowing who Wayfair is and not knowing who Wayfair is is the difference between whether those jobs are there or not. So um, Monaghan are, are building out a particularly ambitious kind of chapter, chapter there. And I suppose they see a great opportunity in it, just, just to, re to reference that particular point. On funding, we have, like any community group, I suppose, back to the foundations of, of Grow Remote, they think the landscape for funding is, is for communities is a minefield. I've been to Brussels three times last year to try and understand. I've asked every county. Counties seem to do it differently between them. And so we have, we have um, wherever there's a fund open, we have an application in. Um, in terms of the LEOs, um, it has been, so LEOs are, everybody in fact that we've been working with has been fantastic. And locally, particularly in the likes of Tullamore, they've been great, right, and really proactive on it. But because we're a national organisation, it's hard to actually structure engagement with the LEOs without it just being one-off cases here and there. So that's like one of the challenges that we have because when we did rise, uh, we rose nationally. So, you know, it wasn't as if we were just in Tullamore or Offaly or, or Galway. 
on female, on, 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 on kind of uh, women and that side of it, um, huge, hugely important to me personally. Um, we have, don't actually have any stats in it, but I'll tell you a story of one woman who is in our chapter. She is a single mother, was living in Dublin. Um, she had to, because she was renting, she was had to move out. When you ha I never even occurred to me, but obviously when you have to move uh, out, you need to move your child out of school. Huge interruption to her life. Said, absolutely can't do this. Moved to a commuter town. Convinced her boss, again, to allow her ad hoc to work remotely. Um, and through Grow Remote, was able to get a referral into a, a bigger remote working company and get a proper kind of full-time uh, uh, remote working job. So there, that's the kind of stuff that we're seeing. I don't have any stats in it, but a Bodu, um, an Irish uh, uh, recruitment company, are, are focused on kind of unconscious bias in in hiring employee mom are focused on taking women who have been staying at home and bringing them back into the workforce and work juggle as well are focused on kind of enabling that workforce to come back so it's a huge part of this not a sole part but a huge part of it um, I think that I have answered all the questions there thanks Tracy uh, Minister yeah, uh, thanks very much. Uh, first of all I'll go back to uh, Senator Hopkins about balance law and I think this is one of the, the things that happens is that we put a lot of energy into getting something ready, and then it seems to flatline, sometimes because uh, it takes a while to get it moving and to get the, project, uh, to the trajectory right. But the most important thing I would say is that we have a broadband officer in every local authority now, and we will be looking to the broadband officer to map what assets we have, so that we can say, in County Galway, we have a hub in Banislow, we have a digital hub here, whatever it is. We have libraries which are open access. So we actually have our assets mapped so that we can say to somebody, well, I'm looking for a space. Well, you can go to Banislow or whatever. But the promotion of it is something that, that is, 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 is um, I think Banislow is a county council building. It was the, the, the libraries downstairs and the, isn't that right? And, and it's the old church. So basically, or the old uh, convent. So basically, it is a fine space, but we need to be able to promote that through the Leos, through, through the IDE, and through Enterprise Ireland, or whatever. So there is a lot of that. And just to say, uh, I know that uh, Grow Remote will be engaging with, with um, the broadband officers, uh, Tracy's meeting them uh, next month, to see how they can collaborate with Grow Remote and Grow Remote with them to actually uh, make people more aware of things. Come back to the question, uh, Deputy Smith, about the the, the um, stats about um, gender uh, participation. Uh, the WDC have done um, a research and they've published um, the benefits, they've done research on the benefits of remote uh, working and uh, the gender balance. So that's, that's the WDC region. So at least that might give you a flavor for what's on that. It's on their website or we can get it to you as well. Um, I think you mentioned about, you know, the communities and providing jobs, you know, we have to provide the jobs. I would differ slightly with you on it because I think what we have to do as legislators or politicians or policy makers is we have to provide the infrastructure to allow the jobs to be created. And if you have a, a vibrant community, which we have lots of them around the country, we need to harness that. And the example of Tubber Curry is one that, that I've seen firsthand where there are so many uh, uh, moving parts but they're all moving together and they're all You're they're all they're all on sync yeah. and that is very important <clears throat> uh, and and they are then uh, on the same page as the local authority as sligo it uh, and and with the the uh, on post and all the other organizations who are involved in that action group so they they are a solid block moving together and it's come back to what um, senator coffee said about you know um, departments being islands and not knowing what's going on. But it's the same thing in communities. Absolutely. Every organisation needs to work together and are in lots of cases, but we need to encourage more of that as well so that we're all doing the same, moving the same way. Um, and back, you mentioned about funding. As I said earlier, there are so many funding streams available, um, for, for, f but we also have so many assets, existing assets, that we, we probably don't realise that they're there. Uh, or don't think that they're there or that we should use them the way we should be. Like I was, the example I've given about the libraries before earlier. So where we don't have them, we can target buildings that are derelict and get them opened up. But that seems to be the high energy part of it. And the thing is, we shouldn't be doing that unless we have a sustainable plan and how we're going to get it to be filled as well afterwards. You know.
Thanks, Minister. I, I'm going to bring in uh, Senator Hopkins there briefly and, and, and Paul afterwards. Yeah, uh, um, thanks for your um, comments. Um, I suppose I just want to say um, from what the Minister said in his previous contribution, it's, it's, very, it's very positive that FDIs are asking questions about seeing potential of working from home. Um, so we, we want to benefit from that potential in our rural areas. Um, I, I just really want to emphasise, I suppose, and the Minister um, mentioned um, kind of a directory in the broadband officers, and I think that is important um, because there is need for some level of coordination. Um, and obviously the word communication has been used quite a number of times. Um, but it's, it's, it's about knowing where um, resources are, such as Bonless Lower, such as Aris and Gundy and Roscommon Town. Um, that's one point of it. The second point of it is that I, I really believe there is a piece of work that's needed with companies, um, not necessarily around, well, potentially, of course, satellite offices if, if they wish to do so, but a mixture in terms of, you know, one-off working or more than that. Um, but there is definitely a, a piece of work that's needed because we have under utilisation at the moment when infrastructure is in place. Um, so I, and, and I think it's a point that we need to take cognizance of within the context of, of this committee as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Senator. Uh, Paul? Uh, just building on that, and I'd like to address some of the, the questions that um, Minister Rabbit and uh, Minister Smith also brought up. But having worked in the technology sector for the last 25 plus years, the elephant in the room is very much the technology. Everyone talks about the technology. That's what gets the attention. The mouse that roars like the lion is very much the culture and the processes. And that's what's missing with uh, the companies, the employers today, is that they're looking at, do we have the broadband? Do we have the offices? Do we trust the employees? Um, if you look at the Sunday business papers or forums like World Economic Forum, you know, hashtags like the future of work are looking at AI, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, replacing human jobs. Others are talking about digital transformation, and it's the disruption of business models, Airbnb, Uber, etc. The mouse that roars is really getting that dialogue and figuring out the processes and the culture, both for the employees as well as for the employers. Customers have already moved to this. Customers don't mind if you're based in India or Timbuktu, but yet we have very outdated, very primitive processes and culture around allowing employees to live literally anywhere in the world that they want to and connect them to their employers, to their customers, to their partners, anywhere that they want to be. So it's really, there are four sort of key ingredients in this um, that I've seen from inside the technology sector. It's people, it's process, it's technology, and it's culture. And it's taking, and very much to what Senator Coffey had said, instead of this you know, siloed approach, it's a systematic approach where you're optimizing the system, not looking just at the technology, but the people, the processes, the technology, and the culture that makes this work for employers, for employees, for customers, and ultimately for communities as well. Um, I'm going to bring in Deputy O'Keefe and Deputy Fitzmaurice. I think this is a fascinating debate. The possibilities are limitless. And I think the last statement made, locations are relevant, is probably 70 percent true. And I think there's going to be so many variations on this particular theme that literally the limitations are only going to be our imagination. Now, I have to say, Minister, I think there's one irony in all of this. And that is that when you look at decentralised government departments, apart from education at loan and whatever, basically they were co-located working places. And the more the digital revolution was taking place, the more the arguments against decentralisation fall. Because did it really make any difference when you rang the Department of Environment and you thought you were talking to the customer that you were actually talking to Balana? No, it made no difference. Did the person physically have to be beside the next person to work with? No, not really. We all as TDs operate in different locations all the time. Most of us of our staff, well away from where we ourselves are located. So I've always believed this is literally the limits of our own mind. 
and I welcome the idea here. Now, I'd have just a few questions about the idea. You seem to be saying about co-location places, say, out in Cardamona or whatever. And I'm looking for something like that in Cardamona, but only for one reason. And the reason is quite simple, that only 100 out of the 400 houses around Cardamona have gigabit technology, and the rest are on 5 megabits, and they can't work away from home. So I have a lot of existing businesses that can't get in the net, so we need a co-located place within four or five miles to bring them together so we can connect them with the gigabit. But those who have the direct connection with the gigabit are working from home and so on. And I just would like to ask, I suppose the question relates to that and then if two other questions. The question that relates to that is, um, if everybody had the gigabit that we should have, i.e. the fibre to the home, and I, 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 mobile technology is no good because it's subject to contention all the time. It's great when you're out in the field or something, but it's not a good basic technology for using when you really want to do work and when everyone wants to work at the same time. And therefore, I'm hugely in favour of the fibre connection to your basic place of work and that the other supplementary. Now, my question is, does the co-location co part depend? Now, the second thing is, who are going to avail of this? I see. I see a future, and I've been arguing about this, and it was very interesting. This morning there was a report in the local authority stuff we get every day on the web saying that Dublin is, I think, the second or third most expensive city to live in when you take cost of summer to live versus salary. And, of course, the obvious answer is we're forcing people into here, not because they want to be here. We know that from civil service requests to get out of here, out of Dublin. It's 8 to 1, 10 to 1. Now, I see in some businesses where you have high-end people, they need to physically meet people sometimes. So what I've been arguing is going to happen with our highly educated rural people who are working in the cities. Remember, more percentage higher number of rural people get high level educations than urban people. If you take Dublin, it's about 40 whatever percent. If you take lots of rural learners, it's 55, 60, 65, 70 percent of the young kids growing up. Now, why it doesn't show up as statistics is because when you do the census, they're all in Dublin. But if you start going back to where they got their education, where they grew up, what schools they went to, you suddenly find the statistics show that Access to third level, educa third level edu education is way higher when you take the whole span of Dublin, is way higher in the more rural areas. Now, why is that important? Because a lot of people, when they get to mid 30s, do a reversal on what they were doing in their 18. 18 is two cities. And in 30s, I'd love to be back down the country with the kids in the nice little school I went to, nice safe place, and so on. Now, my prediction is that if we can get the proper technology in, and encourage it and get the employers to think outside the box that we'll have plenty of people who come to the city two days a week, do their meetings, and three days a week work from home. In fact, most people now work six, seven days a week on and off because of access to computers. And I'm wondering what is the government doing to encourage this because it would sort out a lot of your traffic problems that are intractable in our cities. Now, the next issue I have is. It seems from what I read here, unfortunately I wasn't here for the presentation, we had the Dial Reform Committee earlier, and I'm on both. And that is the question that you seem to be going out looking for jobs for people who don't have jobs. Am I right that in other words, you're going out in the market and you're saying, we have a whole lot of really top class people who could go working for you. They live in Bally, they wherever, and if we've got a centre for you, we can get jobs. Now, I think we have a lot of advantages as a people in terms of providing our servicing for multinationals in that we're English speaking and we tend to be people friendly and helpful. Now, here's my question. Have the government a policy to say to the IDA that maybe the day of having to bring the whole factory here is dead and that you can bring a whole lot of jobs to Ireland? A respective location from Tory Island to the corner of Wexford and from 
County Loud right across to the tip of Kerry by just bringing the jobs here without the big infrastructure and the factories and whatever. And will it be given, the IDA be given the remit to go to all these multinational companies and say, do you want outworkers? It's, a, it's amazing. We're going back to the past. The outworker working from home and providing the big mills with product. Do you want absolutely top class people? Can I just make one final point of what Paul said? I actually think, and I, it's one thing, I don't know if people say, share my frustration. I hate dealing with phone companies and banks now. And why do I hate dealing with it? Because you get into some call centre, you get somebody at the far end of the world that doesn't know your problem and you can't get it solved, I'll be honest. And it's not because they're far away, but because it's not the same person ever again. You can never get back to them. And I think that the person who's going to create the call centre with your contact, with your human contact, that knows your file, like your bank manager used to know your file, like the person that you would have known in the telephone company 30 or 40 years ago, knows your case, knows where you are, whatever. And it doesn't matter if they're on the Arctic Circle or in the Antarctic Circle. It doesn't make any difference, but they know your case, understand where you're coming from. I think that's going to become the next fad and the next selling point for companies. Because when you've got a problem, you do most things online, but when you need to talk to a human to sort the problem out, you need a human who understands what your problem is and gets it sorted. So I think that, you know, <coughs> when we talk about no location, I think that might be physically true. It's not mentally or emotionally true. Um, and I think, again, Irish people are good at that kind of, because of, of the small nature of society here, I think we're particularly good at connecting with people on a problem. And if companies were to go that extra step, I think they do a fantastic marketing job for themselves. Thank you, Deputy O'Creed. And we'll take uh, the questions from Deputy Fitzmaurice as well, if that's all right. Uh, Gramagut, um, first of all, thanks for your presentation. Um, Minister, um, I agree fully with the concept of people being able to work be it from a hub or be it at home. Um, as you are aware, no more than anyone else from where we come from, there are a lot of areas that are very short on internet access. And I know that some towns and fairness has been brought up to, to spec on that. Um, I'll be fairly brief on this. Um, you spoke earlier about libraries and different facilities. There are a lot of communities in a lot of small towns, as you are aware of, um, be it all technical schools or be it um, uh, community centres or different buildings in towns that they are trying to refurbish um, and get back into that you can facilitate people and encourage them to set up, be it in a small office. To, you, the first thing you have to do is make sure you have the internet access. Second of all, you have to get the, the building into a state. I know that under red some have done it. Um, but the funding streams that's required takes them a while to get there, to be honest about it. Um, you have some DTBs involved, in fairness to them, um, but you may have to go through leader, and it takes so long. Is there any way that we can streamline something that we target this specifically under, be it the rural programme, that, say, under the Department of Rural Affairs, um, that, we can, that we can hit it and say, well, we're going to give the opportunity, not even to the bigger towns. I am talking about trying to get the smaller towns, the Glenamedes, the, the Belligares, all these sized towns, Strokes towns, you know, the, the, the Castle Rees, to make sure that we can um, keep local people in local areas. You mentioned the broadband officers, and with the best will in the world for some of the broadband officers, um, while you ring them up and you tell them about, um, you ring them up and you tell them about the the situation of broadband. Um, there may be a lot of small businesses in an area um, that explain the situation they're caught up in of bad broadband, but they cannot do anything. To be brutally honest about it, um, really all they are is a messenger at the moment, and when we have the rollout of the national broadband plan right around the country, because there are small businesses in rural areas, I see beside myself you have the likes of Warden Burke, here came out the road 
to within a mile of it, and after that to hell with it. You know, they have no broadband. 22 people are working in it. Broadband is required because they're working in, be it England, and be it Canada, and be it America. But the problem is that we have the infrastructure in place. And while it is great, and I, I, I first I want to acknowledge while it is great that in some towns we are now through air, through private investment, it's not public investment so far, we have um, been put in a situation where it's making it more accessible for those people to do their work. Um, there are a lot of areas around the country that we can't do this, but the funding, and I would ask you, could you work on the leader funding especially, um, that it would be made more available for facilities like that to try and get up and running. I know that, in fairness, the likes of the, the REDS project was a help in areas, um, but to get the, you could need 100, 100 150, 200,000, and it's a payback, because if you look at those people living and working in an area, you may stop them from leaving a rural part of the country to go into a city and putting the pressure on the houses or the housing in the cities. And that's the big, I think like we can, we can go around in circles all day and talk about every bit of smart technology, but we have to, we have got, and I know there are places, and in fairness, down through the last 20 or 30 years, a lot of towns between community centres and different buildings have come up a lot. I'm not saying that we haven't came forward, but to put the final sort of the tin hat on it and make sure that we can get this facility and encourage people into those areas. Um, and it takes money. There's no point. To, you, you talked about a library. I know in one place in Lenamedi we're trying to get the library as a tenant in the, in the, in the technical school. But to get an older biddle and especially brought up to spec, mm -hmm. it takes money. You know you're from the country. You're, 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 you know QS and as good as anybody. Um, and to get that kickstart is the big thing to facilitate the people. It's nearly like going up a stairs. You have to put the first step in and keep putting in all the steps to get to the top and to get there quick enough around the country to facilitate that. And that's the question I have for you. And after that, I have no more. Uh, thanks, Deputy. Uh, Minister. Yeah, well, uh, I just, I, if you don't mind, uh, Trace, i just answer the few questions uh, that, that were, were there about um, the, the first thing there, uh, Deputy O'Keefe, was on about the IDA and um, I think it has moved way beyond what you're talking about, Deputy O'Keefe, in that the foreign direct companies are telling the IDA, we want to see where people can work remotely. So the day of getting 1,000 jobs or 500 jobs into a big building, is, is, is we're moving away from that. We're back to where the FDIs are saying, have we, have we the facility for people to work in their own areas? So, for instance, can they work out of, uh, like we've done in Tobercory, can they work out of Tobercory or can they work out of these other towns remotely, work remote? And that's what, that's what it's all about. So the, uh, the, the IDA, they don't need any remit because the remit, the demand is for this from the foreign direct companies. So what we have to do is to provide the facilities so that it can be achieved. And that's, what, that's the way it's working. So FDIs are, are telling, we, we as, uh, there's no point in us telling the IDA what they should be doing. They're actually, we have to facilitate it's the FDIs. Government and, normally do, but go ahead. Uh, but it's, it's, that, that's the way it is. So basically, uh, uh, the, the, the FDIs, uh, the FDIs are, are in that space where we have to uh, provide and also map out what we're doing uh, and what we have for, f to say, well, look at, in, in Tume, you can work remotely, or in Glen you can work rem remotely. So we, we have to do that. So coming back then to what you're saying, uh, uh, Michael, in relation to the, the broadband officers, uh, and I, I, I do agree to a certain extent up to now there have been, you rang them when you found out to find out where you were on the broadband rollout. But basically the broadband officer concept is, a, is completely different from that. I was saying before you came in, for instance, uh, Senator Hopkins is talking about Balnus Law, where the library, over the library was uh, vacant for 18 months after it was turned into one of these hubs. That the broadband officer is there to co co coordinate what we have, the assets we have, so that the IDA know what we have, so that the Enterprise Ireland, and I was saying earlier that um, Grow Remote are going to meet with the broadband officers to try and get more collaboration on the concept that we have here as well. So the broadband officer's role is, is, is going to, 
the, uh, I think it'll be going from what you call being a, a broadband officer that it'll be uh, an office within the broad within the local authority, like, uh, so that people will be able to go in there and 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 get more information about where they could locate. Um, I don't think that uh, but, uh, Tracy can answer itself. That the grow remote is is not a concept where we're trying to get companies. I think the jobs are there, is to get people to apply for them. That's the, 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 the jobs are available, is to get people to apply and, and to know that they're there. So a lot of what's going on is, is, is in relation to knowledge and understanding of what actually is out there. Um, you mentioned about the old buildings and you mentioned about the leader fund and Deborah Rabbit uh, mentioned it earlier on. Basically, uh, where we have buildings that we can utilise fine and where we have buildings that are derelict in places where we don't have a library or whatever, we should be looking at them uh, to, to, to bring them back into use. Um, personally, I think the Rural Regeneration Fund is the way to go because you took about 200,000 or 500,000 to do up a building between Fire Cert, the whole shooting match, that's where the money is. Right? So that's what we should be looking at is identifying um, uh, buildings in towns where, where, where we could utilise them for multi-purpose use then as well. But where we have a library in place, uh, we should, uh, I said earlier, the library shouldn't be a, a closed shop from, uh, and only open from uh, nine, half nine in the morning or nine o'clock at five. So we have the open li library access is going on now. So in a, a large number of, of libraries, we're rolling out where you get a card, you can access it from eight o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night, 365 days a week. That's happening already. And you have, you can take out your books, you can put them back in without, uh, uh, through the card. So all of this kind of stuff is happening. But I, I think that the leader is one thing, uh, you know, the people can apply through a leader, but I think the Rural Regeneration Fund is, is probably where uh, a lot more can be done, and I think the opportunities are there, and the funding is there. There's one billion uh, available over the next uh, 10 years, and there's 315 available in the next three or four years. So I think what we need to be doing is to look at all the means of funding. <coughs> but I said also earlier that every town could have a different asset and a different ask. So we just kind of give the same thing to everybody. And that's why we've done a pilot scheme on six towns for them to come back with what they want from the ground up, rather than people at central government telling them, this is what we're going to give you. So that we try and change the, the whole thinking process about how we develop the, the villages. Um, that's it, I think. I think I've covered yes, it all. Right. If a... Just before I call in Tracy, I have uh, Deputy Kenny wants to come in there for... No, I, I was just going to ask in regard to the, the, the libraries, um, I'm just thinking of the local libraries that I know in my area, and I don't see how they would be suitable, because you have public access in and out through them all the time. Uh, there isn't space, in general, and I'm just wondering, uh, really what, what I would see, and I, like, I'm just thinking of a town beside me, Mohull, there's an old vocational school sitting lying there for years and years and years, and I actually went to the VEC and asked them, you know, there was a community project, where they wouldn't let them into it. Mm -hmm because they said, oh no, we had an experience of that before, where we let community projects in and we couldn't get them out. <laughs> and, 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 you know, this is, the, this is the kind of thing you're up against. And I, I absolutely concur, this is the direction we need to be going in. But, for instance, if you take, if you take um, a building that may be owned by a community in a small town or village around the country, and there are many of them that are in disrepair, and if they said, okay, let's set this up here, how many workspaces are you talking about to make it viable? Would you want to have workspace for 20 people in it? Would you want a workspace for 10 people in it? What's, what's, a viable, what's a viable option in, res, in relation to that? And where are they going? If they said, Let, we'll do this tomorrow, we'll meet on Friday night and we'll have the application into you on, on, on Friday week, who do they send the application to? Where is the money going to come from? And how quickly can you do this? Because rural communities, and I take your point, they have to put, and I know Kilty Live, I was involved with the setting up of it, I understand what they've done, and I know that we're trying to do the same in our own parish, and the problem is we haven't got houses. There's no, there's no house for rent anywhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you, the, the realities sometimes on the ground are different to what we actually need to try and, 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 and imagine what they're like. And we, we do need to be proactive and we do need to come up with, with imaginative ways forward and all of that. But really, we need to have a, a very set line of how we can achieve this. And, Minister, I know you're a man that can do that. And I, and I, I encourage you to come up with that solution. and you don't, you, you don't say how the space could be in it. And just say to you that, that uh, don't rule anything out. Uh, you go to Trouble Curry and see what they're doing. 
And the thing is, even if it's just that somebody wants to go into that library you're talking about on a Friday or a Saturday or a Sunday, they can or they will be able to do that. But that's not a full time job. No, this is what I'm saying is if people want to get into the libraries, we're making them, digitising them, put money into creating digital facilities within libraries and also getting them open access to the libraries. That's just part of the overall thing. The other thing I would say to you is that in relation, you're saying, how many, peop how many uh, desks do you need? Well, I've seen places where they set up, for instance, back in Hedford, they set it up in, in a sports club in, in my villa upstairs and they put in, I think it was 10 spaces mm -hmm. and just set up. Uh, we, we did it over the space of two weeks, and they got, uh, um, uh, I think, about 2,000 from Galway County Council to get it set up, and they set it up. And it's been run um, uh, 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 there nice and quietly within uh, an existing uh, sport complex. So there's, there's no set way. It's, it's all about using the assets you have and, and see what you can do. If you have a building that's, that, that is um, set up, there's the Digital Innovation Fund, which can help fund innovation within that building then as well. So you ask, where do you go? Well, now, your local authority, if it's a local authority building, Deputy Morris will know that Dunmore, the vocational school there, and I was involved in it, taking it from the VEC at the time and transferring it into an enterprise centre. That did happen. You will have challenges, and if, the, if there's no other use for a public building like that, common sense will prevail. Heads will come together on it. Maybe not all the time, but we'll keep working on it. Fred, Tracy. Um, okay, I'll take each of those uh, points um, in so much as I can. On a database, we actually have that. So Tech Ireland, um, led by Neve Bushnell, um, has a database on techireland.org forward slash hubs, and it lists all of the hubs, 200 plus across Ireland. Um, so that, that's your kind of home for that. Um, the next piece was, I have writ notes written down here on broadband, and I thought, oh gosh, I'm not sure that I'll, that I'll, uh, that I'll go into it. I suppose, look at. I'm 29. Uh, I've decided to move back into the regions from Dublin and other areas. I want to be living in a place that is more than just bring us broadband. There needs to be a bigger vision. Broadband is only an enabler. So, and we know, and we heard it from Banlaslow, that in areas, and by the way, we have a fantastic uh, chapter in Banlaslow, but from areas that do have it, it doesn't solve the world's problems. So we need to take a holistic view. Um, uh, 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 in this, these approaches. Um, uh, Deputy Cueve, you, you spoke about um, rural areas and in the 30s there's a group in Canada who study rural rejuvenation and they speak about that, about how that's exactly when people move back and if you want to target this demographic you need to speak to them about schools and target their kids more so, right? Um, and one of the things that remote work does is level the playing field. One remote working company, recruitment firm, says talent and opportunity are, no, talent and intelligence are equally distributed, opportunity is not. That, the gap, that, that's tightening up. So when your job isn't location dependent, communities can compete on a fair playing field with urban areas and people are making the choice depending on whether they want to live in one area or the other. And by the way, I was listening back to the sessions and I did hear you speak about decentralisation and how you know, that, that, that could be you know, where, where we could go. And I, I referenced it in our first part as in remote work is essentially that, but for a private industry and, and by choice. Um, the next piece I will say is that broadband officers, we work with them already I suppose, um, individually, um, tremendous, right? And looking at broadband more than just a utility, looking at everything that it will enable. Uh, Kieran in Donegal, for instance, was a huge part of getting our chapters up and running. That subsequently led, led to Armour Island getting people trained up in the skill of remote work. So I, I've, just from my, my own experience, and we are on the ground, like that, that's, that, that's where we are, um, it, it has been really positive experience. Experience. Um, in reference to the IDA, it's great to hear that, that that's happening there. I would actually say that the IDA probably started this. When I was in Galway, Shopify were announced, uh, you know, X amount of remote, remote jobs. I saw overnight the likes of Aidan and Moron walk into our co-working space. I'd never seen them before. And that's where, as I say, there are many catalysts to go remote. I saw the power of what could happen. Um, so I'd say that they had a huge part in, in, in building this, catalyzing this momentum. Um, the last piece then is, is um, in terms of the jobs are already there. They are already there and that's kind of the first stream of, of how we're approaching companies. But the second one is encouraging the Irish companies who do ad hoc, yes you can go and live wherever you want, um, 
to start developing policies, procedures and the culture and, and the technology that's needed around that to make sure that it's sustainable. If they keep going on an ad hoc basis, when we're not at full employment, those jobs would probably be the first to go. So we need to make sure while we're at full employment, while there's a talent war on, that we're encouraging companies with a sense of urgency to, to, to implement all of these tools and policies that we need to make sure it's sustainable growth into the regions. Um, and those are my points. Thanks, Tracy. Um, you sure, Minister? I think um, it's great to have such positivity from, from, from young people uh, in the room, and I just want to compliment, compliment uh, yourselves on, on the belief and the this positive enthusiasm and uh, I think it's it's an example for us all so thank you well done Please. on behalf of the committee I want to thank you Minister Kenny for, for coming here today and your officials I want to thank you Tracy and Paul uh, I think there's a very worthwhile engagement and uh, I want to wish you well um, I, I think it's an area that we need to work on as a committee um, and you know, do a report in relation to remote working and how we can advance that whole cause. Um, so thanks again. Um, no, I, I just, just to conclude the meeting, um, the, I propose that the joint committee now adjourns until 10:30 a.m. on Wednesday, the 20th of February. Is that is that agreed? agreed.